Hi, everybody. All right, today we are continuing our short story re uh, unit by reading Joyce Carol Oates' short story, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Um, before we get started, a little bit about Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, she was born in 1938 in Syracuse, New York, grew up on a farm, um, didn't have a lot of money, but her parents were very supportive of her becoming a writer. And she actually became a preeminent American woman's writer, broke a lot of boundaries in her career. Um, she graduated valedictorian of her university class. She taught English at um, University of Wisconsin, Madison. She taught at certain universities in Canada, and then she also ended up teaching at Princeton. So she was, she received many awards and honors. And um, what she's known a lot for is the depiction of evil and violence um, in American society. This story kind of shows you a little bit of that and who she is as a writer and building suspense and things like that. So we're gonna take a look at this, where are you going and where have you been? And while we're reading, I'm gonna start reading um, the first little bit and then we're gonna jump ahead to the end and I'm gonna read the ending after you get done reading everything else. So. Um, I want you to think about some of the things that we talked about with character and character analysis, particularly how Oates chooses to describe Connie in the beginning. I want you to think about that as I'm reading it and how that sets up who she is as a character and like some of the things that happen in the plot and that help to develop the theme throughout the story. Okay, so we're going to begin. Where are you going? Where have you been? By Joyce Carol Oates for Bob Dylan. Her name was Connie. She was 15 and she had a quick, nervous, giggling habit of craning her neck to glance into mirrors or checking other people's faces to make sure her own was all right. Her mother, who noticed everything and knew everything and who hadn't much reason any longer to look at her own face, always scolded Connie about it. Stop gawking at yourself. Who are you? You think you're so pretty? She would say. Connie would raise her eyebrows at these familiar old complaints, look right through her mother into a shadowy vision of herself as she was right at that moment. She knew she was pretty and that was everything. Her mother had been pretty once too, if you could believe those old snapshots in the album, but now her looks were gone and that was why she was always after Connie. Why don't you keep your room clean like your sister? How have you got your hair fixed? What the hell stinks, hairspray? You don't see your sister using that junk. Her sister June was 24 and still lived at home. She was a secretary in the high school Connie attended, and if that wasn't bad enough, with her in the same building, she was so plain and chunky and steady that Connie had to hear her praised all the time by her mother and her mother's sisters. June did this, June did that. She saved money and helped clean the house and cooked, and Connie couldn't do a thing. Her mind was all filled with trashy daydreams. Their father was away at work most of the time, and when he came home, he wanted supper, and he read the newspaper at supper, and after supper, he went to bed. He didn't bother talking much to them, but around his bent head, Connie's mother kept picking at her until Connie wished her mother was dead, and then she herself was dead, and it was all over. She makes me want to throw up sometimes, she complained to her friend. She had a high, breathless, amused voice that made everything she said sound a little forced, whether it was sincere or not. There was one good thing. June went places with girlfriends of hers, girls who were just as plain and steady as she, and so when Connie wanted to do that, her mother had no objections. The father of Connie's best girlfriend drove the girls three miles to town and left them at a shopping plaza so they could walk through the stores or go to a movie, and when he came to pick them up again at 11, he never bothered to ask what they had done. They must have been familiar sights, walking around the shopping plaza in their shorts and flat ballerina slippers that always scuffed the sidewalk, with charm bracelets jiggling on their skin wrist, thin wrists. They would lean together to whisper and laugh secretly if someone passed who amused or interested them. Connie had long, dark, blonde hair that drew everyone's eye to it, and she wore part of it pulled up on her head and pulled out the rest if she let and of it she let fall down her back. She wore a pullover jersey blouse that looked one way when she was at home and another way when she was away from home. Everything about her had two sides to it, one for home 
and one for anywhere that was not home. Her walk, which could be childlike and bobbing, or languid enough to make anyone think she was hearing music in her head. Her mouth, which was pale and smirking most of the time, but bright and pink on these evenings out. Her laugh, which was cynical and drawling at home. Ha ha, very funny, but high-pitched and nervous anywhere else, like the jingling of the charms on her bracelet. Sometimes they did go to shopping or to a movie, but sometimes they went across the highway, decking fast across the busy road to a drive-in restaurant where older kids hung out. The restaurant was shaped like a big bottle, though squatter than a real bottle, and on its cap was a revolving figure of a grinning boy holding a hamburger aloft. One night in midsummer, they ran across, breathless with daring, and right away, someone leaned out a car window and invited them over. But it was just a boy from high school they didn't like. It made them feel good to be able to ignore him. They went through the maze of parked and cruising cars to the bright lit fly infested restaurant, their faces pleased and expectant as if they were entering a sacred building that loomed up out of the night to give them what haven and blessing they yearned for. They sat at the counter and crossed their legs at the ankles, their thin shoulders rigid with excitement, and listened to the music that made everything so good. The music was always in the background, like music at a church service. It was something to depend upon. All right, about to introduce a new character, a boy named Eddie. Up until this point, I want you to think about, again, how the character of Connie has been developed so far, um, what choices the author makes in describing her, um, and where you think that might lead. Kind of think about making a prediction with her character and character develop. Now, we're going to fast forward, um, or I'm going to fast forward on the reading all the way to page to page number 14. This paragraph right here, she rushed forward and tried to lock the door. So you read on your own and get to that point and then um, come back to this video. If you pause the video, do your reading and then come back, we'll read the ending together. Okay, I'm going to move forward and read the ending. Page 14. She rushed forward and tried to lock the door. Her fingers were shaking. But why lock it? Arnold friend said gently, talking right into her face. It's just a screen door. It's nothing. One of his boots was at a strange angle, as if his foot wasn't in it. It pointed out to the left, bent at the ankle. I mean, anybody can break through a screen door and glass and wood and iron or anything else if he needs to. Anybody at all, and especially Arnold Friend. If this place got lit up with a fire, honey, you'd come running out into my arms, right into my arms and safe at home, like you knew I was your lover and it stopped fooling around. I don't mind a nice shy girl, but I don't like no fooling around. Part of those words were spoken with a slight rhythmic lilt, and Connie somehow recognized them. The echo of a song from last year about a girl rushing into her boyfriend's arms and coming home again. Connie stood barefoot on the linoleum floor, staring at him. What do you want? She whispered. I want you, he said. What? Seen you that night and thought, that's the one. Yes, sir. I never need to look anymore. My father's coming back. He's coming to get me. I had to wash my hair first. She spoke in a dry, rapid voice, hardly raising it for him to hear. No, your daddy is not coming, and yes, you had to wash your hair, and you washed it for me. It's nice and shining and all for me. Thank you, sweetheart, he said with a mock bow, but again, he almost lost his balance. He had to bend down to adjust his his boots. Evidently, his feet did not go all the way down. The boots must have been stuffed with something so that he would seem taller. Connie stared out at him and behind at Ellie in the car, who seemed to be looking off towards Connie's right into nothing. This, Ellie said, pulling the words out of the air one after another as if he were just discovering them. You want me to pull out the phone? Shut your mouth and keep it shut, Arnold Fred said, his face red from bending over, or maybe from embarrassment, because Connie had seen his boost. This ain't none of your business. What? What are you doing? What do you want? Connie said. If I call the police, they'll get you. They'll arrest you. Promise was not to come in unless you touch that phone, and I'll keep that promise, he said. He resumed his erect position and tried to force his shoulders back. He sounded like a hero in a movie declaring something important. 
but he spoke too loudly, and it was as if he were speaking to someone behind Connie. I ain't made plans for coming in that house where I don't belong, but just for you to come out to me the way you should. Don't you know who I am? You're crazy, she whispered. She backed away from the door, but did not want to go into another part of the house, as if this would give him permission to come through the door. What do you? You're crazy, you. Huh? What are you saying, honey? Her eyes darted everywhere in the kitchen. She could not remember what it was, this room. This is how it is, honey. You come out, and we'll drive away, have a nice ride. But if you don't come out, we're going to wait till your people come home, and then they're all going to get it. You want that telephone pulled out? Ellie said. He held the radio away from his ear and grimaced, as if without the radio, the air was too much for him. I told you, shut up, Ellie, Arnold friend said. You're deaf. Get a hearing aid, right? Fix yourself up. This little girl's no trouble. and It's going to be nice to me, so Ellie, keep to yourself. This ain't your date, right? Don't hem in on me. Don't hog. Don't crush. Don't bird dog. Don't trail me he said in a rapid, rapid, meaningless voice, as if he were running through all the expressions he'd, he'd learned, but was no longer sure which of them was in style, and then rushed on to new ones, making them up with his eyes closed. Don't crawl under my fence. Don't squeeze in my chipmunk hole. Don't sniff my glue. Suck my popsicle. Keep your own greasy fingers on yourself. He shaded his eyes and peered in at Connie, who was backed against the kitchen table. Don't mind him, honey. He's just a creep. He's a dope, right? I'm the boy for you, and like I said, you come out here nice like a lady and give me your hand and nobody else gets hurt. I mean, your nice old bald-headed daddy and your mummy and your sister in her high heels. Because listen, why bring them in this? Leave me alone, Connie whispered. Hey, you know what that old woman down the road, the one with the chickens and stuff, you know her? She's dead. Dead? What, you know her? Arnold Fred said. She's dead. Don't you like her? She's dead. She's, she isn't here anymore. But don't you like her? I mean, you got something against her, some grudge or something? Then his voice dipped as if he were conscious of a rudeness. He touched the sunglasses perched on top of his head as if to make sure they were still there. Now, you be a good girl. What are you going to do? Just two things, or maybe three, Arnold friend said. But I promise, it won't last long and you'll like me the way you get to like people you're close to. You will. It's all over for you here, so come on out. You don't want your people in any trouble, do you? She turned and bumped against a chair or something, hurting her leg, but she ran into the back room and picked up the telephone. Something roared in her ear, a tiny roaring, and she was so sick with fear she could do nothing but listen to it. The telephone was clammy and very heavy, and her fingers groped down to the dial, but were too weak to touch it. She began to scream into the phone, into the roaring. She cried out, cried for her mother. She felt her breath start jerking back and forth in her lungs as if it were something Arnold's friend was stabbing her with again and again with no tenderness. A noisy, sorrowful wailing rolls all up around her and she locked inside the way she was locked inside this house. After a while, she could hear again. She was sitting on the floor with her wet back against the wall. Arnold's friend was saying from the door, that's a good girl. Put the phone back. She kicked the phone away from her. No, honey, pick it up. Put it back right. She picked it up and put it back. The dial tone stopped. That's a good girl. Now you come outside. She was, was hollow with what had been fear, but what was now just an emptiness. All that screaming had blasted it out of her. She sat, one leg cramped under her, and deep inside her brain was something like a pinpoint of light that kept going and would not let her relax. She thought, I'm not going to see my mother again. She thought, I'm not going to sleep in my bed again. Her bright green blouse was all wet. Arnold friend said in a gentle, loud voice that was like a stage voice, The place where you come from ain't there anymore, and where you had in mind to go was canceled out. This place you are now, inside your daddy's house, is nothing but a cardboard box I can knock down any time. You know that, and I always did know that. You hear me? She thought, I have got to think. I have got to know what to do. We'll go to a nice field out in the country here where it smells so nice and it's sunny, Arnold friend said. I'll have my arms tied around you so you won't need to get away, and I'll show you what love is like, what it does. The hell with this house. It looks solid, all right, he said. He ran a fingernail down the screen, and the noise did not make Connie shiver. 
as it would have the day before. Now put your hand on your heart, honey. Feel that? That feels solid too, but we know better. Be nice to be. Be sweet like you can because what else is there for a girl like you but to be sweet and pretty and give in and get away before her people come back. She felt her pounding heart. Her hand seemed to enclose it. She thought for the first time in her life that it was nothing that was hers, that belonged to her, but just a pounding living thing inside this body that wasn't really hers either. You don't want them to get hurt, Arnold Friend went on. Now get up, honey, get up all by yourself. She stood. Now turn this way. That's right, come over to me. Ellie, put that away. Didn't I tell you, you dope, you miserable, creepy dope? Arnold Friend said. His words were not angry, but only part of an incantation. The incantation was kindly. Now come out through the kitchen to me, honey, and let's see a smile. Try it. You're a brave, sweet little girl. Now they're eating corn and hot dogs cooked to bursting over an outdoor fire. And they don't know one thing about you and never did. And honey, you're better than them because not a one of them could have done this for you. Connie felt the linoleum under her feet. It was cool. She brushed her hair back out of her eyes. Arnold Friend let go of the post tentatively and opened his arms for her, his elbows pointing in toward each other and his wrists limp to show that this was an embarrassed embrace and a little mocking, and he didn't want to make her self-conscious. She put her hand against the screen. She watched herself push the door slowly open as if she were back safe somewhere in the other doorway, watching this body and this head of long hair moving out into the sunlight where Arnold Friend waited. My sweet little blue-eyed girl, he said in a half-sung sigh that had nothing to do with her brown eyes, but was taken up just the same by the vast sunlit reaches of the land behind him and on all sides of him. So much land that Connie had never seen before and did not recognize except to know that she was going to it. Okay, we will talk about this story in discussion in our next class. I want you to sit down and think about the characters and how the development, Oates' development of the characters help lead to the ending part of this scene. All right, have a great day, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.